The sun has set on a day Jerusalem and the Middle East won't soon forget. Hello, everyone. I'm Francois Picard. Welcome to a special edition of the France 24 debate. We're broadcasting live from Jerusalem, looking out over the old city on the day where Donald Trump's uh, move of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem became reality, a day that's marked to coincide with Israel's 70th anniversary. We're going to be asking uh, our guests over the next hour, does it mark a turning point uh, for Israel, for the Palestinians, and for the Middle East peace process? whether or not uh, it means, uh, for instance, the death of the two-state solution as we know it, the U.S. as a mediator uh, for an eventual agreement, the peace process right now, which is uh, at a standstill. Earlier, uh, it was Donald Trump speaking in a video message uh, to the dignitaries assembled at what was the U.S. consulate and is now officially the U.S. embassy here in Jerusalem. On December 6, 2017, at my direction, the United States finally and officially recognized Jerusalem as the true capital of Israel. Today, we follow through on this recognition and open our embassy in the historic and sacred land of Jerusalem. The truth and peace are interconnected. A peace that is built on lies will crash on the rocks of Middle Eastern realities. You can only build peace on truth. And the truth is that Jerusalem has been and will always be the capital of the Jewish people, the capital of the Jewish state. Our coverage begins with France 24 correspondent Iris Mockler. Iris, before I ask you about the latest, what's your reaction to the words you just heard? Um, I'll tell you my reaction to the whole event because it was an interesting American experience uh, and a very religious experience. The word sacred was used, Jewish was used a lot, and although the word peace was used, we heard almost no mention of Palestinians. In fact, the only person who spoke about the Arab citizens of this city, they are 40 percent, almost 40 percent of the population, was actually the president of Israel, Reuben Rivlin, a longtime resident. He spent all his life in this city, and this city is in his blood. And he mentioned the 40 percent Arab population. No one else did. It was it was very strange in that sense, a, a revivalist meeting with no mention of the other people with whom peace has to be made. Uh, it was actually almost more like a cementing of friendship between Washington and Israel than it was, um, I felt, putting the, this region on a path to peace. It's been a, a day of bloodshed elsewhere. We'll be crossing over later to Chris Moore in the Gaza Strip, where dozens have been killed in protests. Uh, Iris, where you're standing at the gates to the old city, uh, you're, uh, sh should we say, at the cusp between East and West Jerusalem. I am, and it's quite quiet here. It's interesting. Uh, there was a general strike planned for Jerusalem. It was cancelled last night. They decided that rather than a strike, what they wanted was a continued presence. We are in this city and we will continue to be here. There were protests uh, around the embassy itself by Arab citizens of Israel and Arab politicians who are in the Israeli parliament. And there were clashes, for example, around Kalandia, the, around Ramallah, uh, not far from here in the West Bank. But really you would have to say that the focus of the protests was Gaza, that we did not see the kind of protests that we saw, for example, a year ago when the citizens of Jerusalem, the Palestinian citizens of Jerusalem, felt there was a threat to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Then everybody came out. You didn't see that for the move of the American embassy to Jerusalem, perhaps something that people here don't feel impact their daily lives in the same way as a real threat or what they perceive to be a real threat to the Al-Aqsa Mosque did. Yeah, that threat to uh, one of the important uh, uh, places of Islam, uh, the threat to a religious place, uh, which triggered more. And that brings us, thank you, Iris Makhla, we'll be checking with you later, to our first guest. We're pleased uh, to welcome uh, Yehuda Glick. Uh, he uh, is uh, somebody who has... Uh, 
uh, long campaigned uh, for Jews to be able to pray on the Temple Mount uh, inside of uh, the old city. Uh, you're a member of parliament uh, for the ruling Likud party. Thank you for being with us on France 24. Shalom from Jerusalem. Shalom from the city that is celebrating today and bringing great light to the world and to mankind. You were present at that ceremony uh, earlier. I was. Uh, uh, your thoughts on what you just I was present uh, on what you just heard there. What, uh, it was I, a I ceremony was, for Jews. It was a ceremony uh, which will have an impact on all of mankind and all humanity. It was a ceremony expressing thanks to God for the miraculous uh, events that we are witnessing these days, uh, from le leading led, led by President of the United States of America, Donald, Donald J. Trump, and led by the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, finally, uh, Jerusalem, which has been the capital of the people of Israel for the past 3,000 years, finally the nations are be starting to become, speak uh, relevant words, and recognizing the obvious that Jerusalem, which has been the capital of the people of Israel for 3,000 years, is finally the nations of the world today, the modern world, are beginning to recognize the obvious that Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish state and the capital of the Jewish people and the biblical capital of God of the world. And that is something that was definitely a great event, and therefore we, we heard a lot of speaking of thanking to God and a lot of uh, expressing uh, a great excitement that finally, 70 years, exactly 70 years after the establishment of the State of Israel, the world that took it some time to recognize the State of Israel is now taking its time to recognize the uh, centrality of the capital of the State of Israel, Jerusalem. So, uh, the, the, uh, as you say, re recognizing Jerusalem, and, and uh, you're adding to it that religious side to it. Israel founded as a Jewish secular state. Is it no longer a Jewish secular state? Israel was founded as a state which represents the uh, uh, prophecies of the prophets from the Bible uh, materializing and becoming a reality. And the prophets, the prophets spoke about the return of the Jewish people home, and that happened, and it's happening in great numbers. They, the, the prophets spoke about settling all over Judea and Samaria, and that is happening, and has happened. The prophets spoke about Israel uh, returning to Jerusalem and to the Temple Mount, and that happened, and is happening. And the prophets spoke in the next step about the nations recognizing Jerusalem and Israel as a light to the nations, and that is happening starting today. And therefore, it's a turn point to all of humanity. If in the time of King Solomon, we saw kings all the way from the Queen of Shiva coming in to, to, to exclaim the, uh, the, uh, the greatness of God and the greatness of his people and the greatness of the city of Jerusalem, now we see President Trump. If 70 years after exile, we saw uh, Cyrus recognizing the rights of Jewish people to build a temple, now we saw uh, President Trump opening a, a, a process where it will, will be followed by many other countries of recognizing Jerusalem as our capital and has been our capital and has actually haven't, has been the capital of the state of Israel ever since it was established. Our prime minister sits here, our president sits here, our government sits here, our Supreme Court sits here, okay. our parliament sits you, here. Right, you're and describing therefore, sorry, you're describing, you're describing Jerusalem as capital of Israel in religious terms. Where does that leave those who are not Jewish? Uh, as far as I know, the Bible is a bestseller in the world, been translated to more languages than any other, any other book. Billions and billions of people believe the Bible. And when we see with our own eyes the words of the Bible uh, materializing and becoming a reality, we have no choice but to, to see that, that, that either you can believe it's a coincidence or you can rationally say that, it's, that, that where the words of the prophets are actually happening and it's, we're seeing uh, the, the hand of God. So you can choose. Those of you who believe in, in, in coincidences will think that the canceling of the uh, evil Iranian agreement and the meetings between uh, North Korea and South Korea and exactly on the 7th the anniversary of Israel, the, the establishment of the of the embassy in Jerusalem. Those of you who want to refer to it as coincidence are welcome to do so. Those of you who want to look at a rational, uh, uh, analyze it rationally, will see that the ambassador David Friedman from the United States of America is representing a beginning of a new era.
and a new era in the redemption process of the return of the Jewish and does people Does that new to era Israel. mean that it's the end of the? Does that new era mean uh, uh, Yehuda Glick that uh, it's the end of uh, what your prime minister still on paper endorses, which is a two-state solution with the Palestinians? Anybody who knows and recognizes it from close, the Middle East knows that the two-state was never a solution. Two-state was, was part of the de deepen, deepening the problem. Anybody who sees the Palestinian Authority led by anti-Semites like Abu Ab Abbas, anybody who sees what's happening in Gaza, where the people, the Palestinian people, are being taken hostage, are being kidnapped by their leadership in order to, to, to actually be a suicide bombs and to, to try to destroy the state of Israel, know that a two-state solution was was never a still a solution. It was in deepening, uh, deepening. So you the believe problem. in a one-state solution? Finally, let me let me ask you this, now, Yehuda Glick. Let me, let me ask you this, Yehuda Glick. You, you don't you don't believe in a two-state solution? Do you yes, think yes, Israel should be a officially a religious state? I don't I don't speak about religious non religious I speak about Israel is happens to be a state which uh, represents the materializing uh, of the uh, words of the prophets from the book. And those people who believe in the book around the world know that Israel is a light to the nations. You, it doesn't have any question about what, whether you're a religious person or you're, you, 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 you demonstrate religious behavior or not. Believers of the book, we know that billions and billions of people, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, Zarathustras, Baha'is from all over the world who believe in the Bible, uh, believe that that we are what we are seeing you just have to read the book and you see it happening and that's what's exactly what we see in front of our eyes the words of the prophets are becoming a reality and you can like it or not you can think it's a coincidence but that those are the facts the prophets said that the jewish people will come back home there is no one, one parallel final question to that for you uh, mankind Yes. Ye Yehuda Glick, you yourself uh, live in a jewish settlement in the west bank why don't you live in jerusalem uh, I live uh, because the state of Israel has, met, has, has many settlements, and I chose with my family to live in in Otniel, which is not far from Jerusalem. It's a 45-minute ride from Jerusalem, and uh, it's part of the, the Judea area. And I'm very proud to live there. I don't. Uh, no, nobody. Ha everybody does. Not everybody has to live in Jerusalem, but I definitely do come to the Temple Mount, which is the world center of peace. And I do encourage people from all all people who believe in God to come to the to the world center of peace called the Temple Mount and turn the place. Instead of being a place which is a world center of incitement and terror, like the radical Muslims want it to be, turn it into a place of, of tolerance, of respect to all human beings, and turn it into a place of a world peace. And that is where we're leading to. We're leading to that no more, no more justification for terror, no more blaming Israel for terror. From now on, the, per the people to blame for terror are the terrorists and those who incite them. And that is what we're saying today on the table. No more justification yeah. for terror and violence. Yehuda Glick, a member of uh, the Knesset, the Israeli parliament for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party. Many thanks uh, for joining us here on France 24. Thank you very much and many, many blessings from Jerusalem celebrating today the light of the universe. Yeah, and we heard the Israeli Prime Minister today uh, talk about it as being, uh, quote, a great day for peace. Let's cross now to France 24's uh, Chris Moore, uh, who is in the Gaza Strip. Uh, it's a very different story from the one we just heard over there. Uh, Chris, tell us what your day's been like. Certainly not a day of peace, uh, Francois. There were uh, at times lethal clashes on the along the border uh, fence which separates the Gaza Strip uh, from Israel. Palestinians gathering uh, at uh, five protest camps where they've been gathering uh, for the past six weeks, albeit in much greater numbers today, and spending much of their day uh, 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 aligning the, uh, the, the border fence, uh, keeping for the most part away from it. But those who did uh, dare to go near it were meet, met with uh, lethal gunfire uh, from, uh, from the Israelis. And as you've seen, uh, the death toll uh, from a single day of demonstrations, it looks like it could uh, reach uh, a total higher than what we've seen uh, over the past six weeks. Going in uh, to these demonstrations, of course, we had uh, the Palestinians uh, urging a, a big turnout. We had Hamas uh, saying that they couldn't oppose anybody uh, seeking to breach the uh, border fence, urging people to go out and, as they put it, uh, make uh, Donald uh, Trump, Trump's plan uh, fail. And on the other side, uh, we had the Israelis uh, really uh, warning people 
uh, dropping leaflets in the eastern Gaza Strip uh, earlier today, warning people about the consequences uh, of uh, going up towards that, effect, that fence, which has become uh, all too clear today. Yeah, do, as you say, dozens killed, uh, as many as had been killed uh, the previous weeks when there had been uh, these protests uh, building up to that move of the embassy and to the 70th anniversary of Israel. What's the mood at the end of the day, Chris? mood at these protests is actually uh, it's interesting and quite hard to define. There are many different kinds uh, of demonstrators arranged in kind of several ranks uh, going back uh, from, I guess, the focal point, which is the, uh, the Israeli uh, border fence. What you see uh, down at, at the front tends to be uh, young people uh, defying the Israelis and, and dicing with death. I mean, there were, there were many, many bullets uh, fired today, uh, a lot of tear gas uh, fired. We were standing uh, at the back of the camp at one point and we saw uh, dozens of stretchers uh, being taken out, many people uh, wounded uh, in the leg. If you talk to people who are prepared to do uh, that kind of thing, there's a whole, a, whole, a whole series of gripes, not just the blockade and the occupation, but the sense uh, of, uh, of desperation amongst many young people here in Gaza. But in terms of what we've seen uh, over the last six weeks compared with what we've seen uh, uh, today and what we are likely to see uh, tomorrow, uh, many other uh, Gazans who tend to stand a little bit further back uh, in the demonstrations uh, will tell you that they told us that it was very important to come there and mark uh, two events which will say simply uh, they, can't, they can't abide by, namely uh, the uh, moving of uh, the uh, US uh, embassy uh, to Jerusalem and tomorrow uh, they'll be out to uh, protest uh, during uh, what is that, Nakba Day in memory of uh, the Palestinians who, who were displaced uh, during the creation uh, of the State of Israel. Chris Moore will be checking back in with you uh, later. Chris Moore reporting live from the Gaza Strip. Uh, we're here at the Mount of Olives in the company of uh, Dalal Irikad, who teaches at uh, the Arab American University, vice president of that institution, also a columnist for Al Quds, advisor to the Palestinian prime minister. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, we just heard our reporter there telling us about the dozens killed in the Gaza Strip. There were protests in the West Bank as well. But the mood is different, it seems, between those two, those two parts. Well, when bad behavior is rewarded, things can only get worse. And I would like to go back now to the December announcement, illegal announcement of Trump, when he had judged the previous um, presidents of the United States of America for having made um, failed assumptions and failed strategies. And he added that he would correct their failures by recognizing Jerusalem as a state, as the capital of Israel. Well, I tell him today what he's celebrating today, what they're doing today by the relocation of the embassy as well, is actually introducing fake and failed realities on the ground. I am one example of Palestinians who was born in Jerusalem. I am a Palestinian from Jerusalem and I will always be. So introducing or creating um, failed and fake realities on the ground does not bring any hope to the peace process here. We just we just spoke with Yehuda Glick, who's a member of the Knesset. He's for, uh, he, he talked about this, the messianic uh, um, aspect of it all, that uh, this is written, all written in the Bible, uh, that, that offers the legitimacy to what's happening in, in politics uh, right now. He, he, people who think like him are no longer the fringe in Israel. And we're seeing on both sides the increasing religiousness uh, of, of what's going on. Why is it becoming more of a religious confrontation? It's the same thing in, in, in the Palestinian territories. Well, this is sad, but if we're going to start labeling or defining cities or states by their race, the race of people who live there or their religion, then I'm sorry, but this is racism at its, at its best. Why is and, it becoming more religious? Well, again, when violence is rewarded, when, uh, when Trump's uh, unilateral steps, when violating all international law, when uh, doing all this, dis disregarding the core values of justice and human rights, when uh, disrespecting the terms of the peace process itself, when leaving the young generations of the Palestinians hopeless. Look at people in Gaza, the thousands are being killed and martyrs every, every day and every week, and nobody cares. What do you expect? Do you feel as though, well, uh the international community is just not paying as much attention as they once were. 
Well, this is another story. I mean, the international community, the, the UN, and we cannot, I'm not going to um, recall the number of the UN resolutions that had stated that any unilateral uh, Israeli decision that would change the status quo of Jerusalem is considered null and, null and void, and that all um, countries and member states of the UN should consider it null and void. And here, I call upon the, all the international community and the states to immediately, starting tomorrow morning or tonight maybe, to recognize East Jerusalem as capital for the Palestinian state and to recognize the state of Palestine. There is nothing left to be done for us as Palestinians. But uh, you've been pushed down, uh, this is the sad reality, uh, of the pecking order of, of, the, of the stories that grab the attention of the international community because of the standoff with Iran, because of the civil war in Syria. Uh, and you also have certain states which uh, seem to be more and more close uh, to Israel uh, within the uh, Arab League. There used to be this unity behind the Palestinians. Now, what's your reaction, for instance, when you see uh, uh, that Saudi Arabia is drawing closer to Israel, that uh, we have statements from uh, the foreign minister of Bahrain on Twitter the, the, this past week where uh, he applauded Israel and its uh, standoff with Iran? Well, Trump just uh, added today on the opening of the embassy that he is recognizing realities again and that he is contributing to the stability of the region. Well, if we see bloodshed and violence and unilateral actions and recognizing annexation, recognizing apartheid, you know, recognizing racism is bringing stability to the region, then maybe we need a new def definition for stability. But why is there this disunity among Arab nations now? Well, I, I, I think the Arab, the Arab League's uh, latest decision was clear and that they stand uh, with the Palestinian uh, leadership. And uh, I, I hope that they will take uh, more solid and rigid uh, positions uh, starting now until maybe tomorrow because morning. Because there seems to be this obsession with the Sunni-Shia divide. And the Palestinian issue, again, is uh, falling into second position there. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're letting religion play a role in our politics and our realities. And this is what I want to uh, disagree with. And I'm calling upon all the Israeli citizens and all the American citizens and all the Palestinians and every civilized citizen of the world to just disagree and not accept bringing or introducing fake and failed um, realities to the ground. We cannot accept uh, to define Jerusalem uh, upon uh, one race or one religion. Jerusalem should be an open city for all Muslims, Jews, Christians, or uh, atheists, no matter what, it should be an open city for all, a city of peace. Are moderates being squeezed out on both sides? Is it harder to be a moderate right now? Well, I can speak on the Palestinian side. We're left with no, with no tools. We have, uh, we have tried the peace talks, we went to negotiations, and we are still for it, and we're still pro-peace and pro-peace pro process, but we need guarantees if we want to go back to the table. Need guarantees. We're going to coming up later this year on the 25th anniversary of the Oslo Accords and the way it carved up uh, the Palestinian territories was supposed to be a temporary solution until a final peace deal was worked out. It's going to be 25 years now. And do you have the sense that this, this two-state solution is dead at this point? Well, I would say and repeat that the two-state solution would be like the best case scenario. But given the realities, the fake and failed realities, again, that the, uh, Trump is, in, is introducing with the help of uh, Netanyahu. And by the way, they're making a strategic failure today. They're, just, they're celebrating today's um, opening, but tomorrow they will regret it. And the history will record this failure um, uh, strategy. Going back to the one or two-state solution, again, two-state solution is the best case scenario. But... We're hopeless now, and I think Palestinians are left with no other choice than calling for a one-state solution where we have equal rights, no matter of religion or race. Dalali Rikab, one final question for you. Um, the uh, United States, uh, what eye do the Palestinians have on it? Because what do they think? You, you yourself studied in the U.S., so you know the, you know the United States well. Uh, they, they, the United States, which for years tries to act as broker, but then they elect this one president and he says, ah, all bets are off at this point. Does that forever mean that the United States can no longer be a broker? Well, if we talk about diplomacy and brokering uh, amid, uh, a peace process, well, I think the American we hear, we need to do differentiate between the American people and the American administration. But the do American, Palestinians yes. make that differentiation? Well, I think it's time we realize that the American administrations, given the current one or the previous ones, were playing were playing coercive diplomacy on Palestinians rather than um, the role of the mediator or the um, the broker.
All right. Well, many thanks uh, for, for joining us, uh, Dalal uh, Irikat, uh, for being with us here in uh, the, this special edition of the France 24 debate. Thank you. Now, uh, looking at, at uh, the uh, old city behind us, you, you, you realize, and we just talked about it with uh, both of our guests, is uh, the context changing in Israel, becoming more and more religious. France 24 correspondent Iris Mockler uh, went to the old city and showed how, yes, it is uh, that place uh, within several hundred meters, you can see over here behind me, uh, that place that has the eyes of uh, all the religions. I'm standing outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Until 1860, this one square mile was the entire city. It's still the most fascinating, lively part of Jerusalem. And because it contains the three great holy sites, it's a magnet for tourists and pilgrims, and also the heart of the conflict. This is the holiest site in Judaism, the Western or Wailing Wall, the last link to the two Jewish temples that once stood here. Since the second temple was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago, that's the temple where Jesus worshipped, by the way, this is where Jews have directed their prayers and now their celebrations. Jerusalem is holy to Christians because it's intimately connected with the story of Jesus. He lived and taught here, and the Bible tells us that he walked along the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, in these streets carrying his cross. Christians believe that this is where he was crucified, died, and rose again three days later. There's been a church here for hundreds of years, and as you can see, thousands of people come here daily. If you want to understand why this conflict is so intractable, you just have to stand here and see how close the holy sites are to each other. Above Judaism's holiest site sits the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. It's the Harami Sharif to Muslims, the third holiest site in Islam, and it contains the golden dome of the rock, still the symbol of the city more than a thousand years after it was built. Since Israel captured the eastern half of this city in 1967, access for Muslim worship to the holy sites has been a constant source of friction. And we're now in the company of Yishai Sarid, uh, who is a lawyer and also an author. Uh, you've written uh, crime novels, which, by the way, in French have sold very well. And uh, one of your novels that you've written, uh, it was published two years ago in French, uh, Le Troisième Temple, The Third Temple. That's the newest one, which was published just a few weeks ago. Oh, okay. La Poète de Gaza was published about three years ago. All right, so there you go. Yes. Here, just to turn this way, just slightly, there you go. Um, the, the Third Temple, and of course, The Third Temple is over there. Tell us, first of all, about the novel itself, because what's the premise of the novel? Until about 2,000 years ago, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque stands now, there was the Jewish temple, which was the center of the um, Jewish uh, kingdom. And uh, in my book, I rebuilt this uh, temple and destruct it in the same novel. There is um, the kingdom of Judea. It all happens nowadays, which replaces the modern state of Israel. There is a king, there is no more democracy, all the Palestinians are out of here, they're deported from here, and uh, it's a new Jewish civilization. And that's what happens, it's about two or three months in the end of this civilization, of this kingdom. And that's from when we came and covered the 60th anniversary of Israel, is what we notice here this time around, is an increasing religiousness. Earlier we had on uh, Likud member Yehuda Glick. Uh, he, he is in favor of this third temple, the way you describe it. He's in favor of a purely religious uh, state. Uh, and that opinion is no longer fringe. It's mainstream now. Yeah, it's, it's almost mainstream. The state of Israel was established by secular people that were antithesis to religion almost. Nowadays, the religious, national religious politicians and the settlers are the main political force in Israel politics, not in their size, but being an avant-garde, being a very influential group, and they lead this way. They lead this way, which is not logical or um, real politic, but it's kind of messianic uh, politics, which involves God very much. You could hear today at the ceremony of uh, opening the embassy here, 
the American embassy, God was the main uh, hero there, you know. And as we all know, God is not interferes very much. You okay, know? but here's the interesting, here's the interesting point. Uh, I got the impression, tell me if I'm wrong, Yisha Sarid, that you heard more uh, religion evoked by Donald Trump and his son-in-law than you even did by Benjamin Netanyahu or, or President Rivlin. There is a strange coalition of um, Jewish national religious people who are very uh, much active in the settlements, in their ambitions to rebuild the, the temple, as I wrote about, a coalition with evangelical Christian Americans. Part of them spoke today, gave speeches in the ceremony, kind of, uh, you know, lunatic preachers. And they have a very strong coalition. Also, in a, they are giving money, and their ambitions is not Jewish ambitions. They, those are Christian ambitions to see the final war, which will resurrect uh, Jesus. So it's kind, you know, for a European or French audience, or around the world, it may, it may seem, you know, crazy. Why? But Why that's is this Israeli, happening now? That's Israeli politics nowadays. Why is it happening? Now? Because Israel is a strange combination of a modern nation with very ancient roots, biblical roots, and the uh, Jewish roots, and it stands in a very crucial crossroads between coming back to ancient times on a fundamental fashion or being a democratic modern state like it was meant to be by the founders of the state of Israel. But nowadays, it turns to the other direction, to the direction of fundamentalism, of going back to biblical times, so-called, of uh, discriminating against other people, of disrespect to minorities. That's unfortunately what happens. Dis disrespect to minorities, what happened, just, sorry for the spoiler, uh, but what happens in the book? No, it's not really a spoiler because it happened already two times in our history. The, <laughs> um, uh, the temple is being destroyed because also uh, God in my book, which is a living character, doesn't want to be locked up in between four little walls, you know, in a small room. He wants to be the big universal God. Uh, almighty God and not God that you go with to wars and you lock him up in the in the temple there. All right, so let's bring it back to this week's events because it's been a great week for Benjamin Netanyahu, right? Donald Trump walks away from the Iran nuclear deal, the signing of uh, uh, the, the ceremony that we witnessed uh, earlier here in, in Jerusalem. Uh, is it, uh, can at one point Israel overplay its hand? Yeah, Israel, you're absolutely right, because Israel militarily and maybe also diplomatically is strongest now today than it was ever before. We have America on our side. We have much of the Arab world on our side, even though they don't declare it. But it's our life here. And our life here are destined to be with our Arab neighbors. We are here in Jerusalem. On this side, this is an Arab neighborhood. A kilometer or, or two kilometers from here is a Jewish neighborhood. We're destined to live together. And by using all, only force like we did today in Gaza or in other places, we couldn't live here peacefully and like human beings uh, should live. You know, only by force and by rifles, etc. That's not, that's the wrong way. And what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing is uh, putting all the cards on this military effort and uh, being friends with America, which is perfectly fine. We have to be strong, but on the same side, he abandons the prospect uh, of peace, which is very, very tragic because this leads to a very bad future. And one final question for you, Yishai Sarid. Uh, your late father was uh, a leading voice for peace. He was uh, a, uh, one of the leaders of the Israeli left. Where is the left in Israel today? The left is in a quite desperate situation because most of Israel is public, most of Israeli citizens lost its hope for peace, unfortunately. How does it get it back? It, it gets... The, most of the blame should be on the Palestinian side. Let's be honest about it. I have a lot of criticism about our government, but when there was the best chance for peace during the Oslo years, the Palestinians began blowing buses all around this city and other parts of Israel, nightclubs, restaurants, etc., etc. So what we should see now, I think, is like Sadat coming to Israel in 1977, su such a show of uh, respect and of uh, dignity, which can, you know, break the barriers. 
I'm not sure wh- how we can do it. Maybe the Saudi king should come here. I don't know. But you, you know, believe? You still believe? Of course believe. We don't have any other choice, you know. I raised three children here, of my, uh, my, myself and of my wife, so we have to be optimistic about it. Nisha Sarid, it's been a pleasure. Many thanks. The name of your book is uh, called The Third Temple, Le Troisième Temple, if you're reading it in French. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. We're going to cross now to uh, correspondent uh, Iris Mockler, who joins us live again from, from Damascus Gate. Uh, Iris, you've been all around in Israel uh, throughout uh, the region, and we're talking about, uh, we just heard Yishai Sarid mention the increasing religiousness uh, in Israel. It's also true when you go to the West Bank. It's true everywhere. You know, when I first started going to Ramallah, I was one of a number of women who didn't cover their hair. Me and my translator, and I remember turning to her one day after a number of years here, and I looked and I said to her, we are the only women with our hair uncovered, and that was in Ramallah. It's not that we are the only women who don't cover their hair in the whole of the city, but in that day, uh, on the streets, we were the only two. And so I'm aware. I'm aware of that in Gaza, uh, where someone said to me, don't cover your hair. I said, how could I not cover my hair here? Um, So there is an increasing religiousness, not just in Israel. There's definitely an increasing religiousness here. I can see that in the time I've lived here too. And if you are a secular person and someone who is looking for secular solutions, uh, let's say to this conflict, it is something that you have to take into account, that both sides are becoming more religious. And when it's land and God... When the two are entwined, it makes it much, hard, much, much harder to reach a, a peace deal only involving land. And uh, on that point, Iris, it's been a day where we've seen, uh, we have seen the uh, um, uh, again a victory for for one side, uh, and we heard our previous guest mentioning how. Um, things can be unpredictable and things can change. Uh, What are your thoughts on that? You know, it was very nice to hear Ishai Sarid say that because it reminded me that there are optimists here who can still reach out to each other and who still believe that they can make a deal and that they that there is an opportunity here because most of the people I speak to, on both sides, by the way, are quite pessimistic. Uh, They don't trust each other any longer. They feel, each side feels, they've held their hand out and they've had it slapped back. Uh, So whoever, whichever side you take, wherever you stand, that's what you hear. Um, And that makes it reassuring when someone says, I have to believe in peace because I'm raising children here even people who are raising children here and in an increasingly religious atmosphere don't feel that they believe in peace and I think that's part of the problem. Iris Makla reporting live from Damascus Gate. Many thanks. Uh, You're watching a special edition on France 24 on uh, what's been a day of contrast uh, in uh, West Jerusalem, the celebration of the move of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv over in Gaza. uh, Dozens killed. uh, And uh, the contrast of Israel, I guess you could say they're personified by our next uh, guest, uh, Jeremy uh, Brabe uh, Adonadlo. I hope I get, almost, 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 almost. Okay. We're, we're getting there. 34 years young and uh, who is uh, <laughs> uh, a, a uh, tech entrepreneur. Israel is the startup nation. And this is the dissonance, if you will, uh, 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 of Israel, uh, where you have this tense political situation and this incredible innovation uh, in the country. Uh, before I ask you how, how you live with that dissonance, uh, first just tell me a little bit about what you do because it's quite neat. You, <laughs> you, you, have a, you have a company, basically, you've figured out... We, we, we basically enable technicians to very easily uh, figure out which part they are working on when they are working on a mechanical system. So they just picture the mechanical part they're working on and it's matched against the database and it enables them to go a lot faster in their maintenance and to reduce the so downtime. They, they, they take a photo of whatever component or part is defective or needs to be changed. And it's matched against the database and it, it's, it tells you which part it is, enables you potentially uh, to order a replacement part or more information or to discuss with an expert. 
in the so part. For you, uh, coming f from to Israel after living in France, that was a choice. Uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, can you can you block it out all the tension and just get on with it? Or? So w what is interesting is that I I believe that the countries at war always generate um, byproduct. You know, it's known that in the Middle East uh, the best parties are in Tel Aviv and in Beirut, and I believe that also high tech is a byproduct of uh, this situation. Meaning that a lot of technology comes from the army, and a lot of people also choose to start their company because no one knows what can happen tomorrow. And if you feel like doing that, then you should doing, do it today. So I don't think that it's a dissonance. I actually believe that it's very much related. It's very much related. So, but when uh, there are dozens killed on a day like today in Gaza, Israel's a small country, but it's far away, enough away that uh, it doesn't affect us here. If we're going to be very cynical about it. Can, can you just, well... Go to bed and not worry about it? Uh, uh, no, it, it's not that you don't worry about it. It's the opposite. You think, okay, people are losing life. The situation is tense. I really need to make things happen now because, you know, you don't know what can happen. Uh, you know, some uh, terrorist can blow in the bus and I can be the next one because I take the bus. So let's make it happen now because our time is limited and the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking and we see that... Uh growing divide is not just between Israelis and Palestinians. There seems to be a growing divide between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, is there not? Because you ha you're here, the city is, uh, the Jewish population is going down. The population that's staying is becoming more religious. Those people are not going to schools where they're learning math and how to code. They're going to re state-sponsored religious schools. Over in Tel Aviv, do you worry about that or it's not your problem? So first, I think that there are different dynamics also in Jerusalem. But of course, the country is divided. But I think that the word itself, and we see in countries such as the United States and France, is getting more and more divided. So I believe that the responsibility of the citizens and also the responsibility of the, the entrepreneurs is to find a way to have people related and have people uh, facing a common goals. But we, of course, worry about that. But uh, I also worry about that when I look at France. But of course, and it's crazy to think that you have such a difference between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, although it's just 60 kilometers apart. Do you feel that divide growing? I feel this divide growing, of course. How do you feel uh, it? Look at the elections, you know, like there is really very strong antagonism. But I feel that there are also, you know, little lights of hope from time to time where, you know, a part of, uh, for instance, the, uh, the ultra-Orthodox are also getting closer and closer to the general population. But uh, there is a real challenge here and we need to face it and we need to, take, uh, to tackle it without, without a doubt. Do you think there could be a point where investors are scared, are spooked by doing business with Israel? To be honest, if they were not scared up until now, I don't think that there is a point where they're, they're going to be scared. I think that what is remarkable about Israel is its re re is resilience, its ability to face the difficulties and face the challenge and tackle them. So I believe that this is what and the opposite attract the investor there because the more we throw at us the more we enable us to take it and face it and overcome it so so far i don't see it as a problem i couldn't let you go without first asking you then how you when you're here in the middle of this chaos that you say is 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 actually ripe uh, the right place for innovation what's your view on, on when you go back to france when you go back to europe <laughs> I think it's another word. It's another word, and it, it really feels like, you know, people don't, you know, there are, they don't really live in the same world, and you don't necessarily feel the same rush, and this is what I'm saying, the same need for resilience and the same uh, fighting spirit that we have here, and I think that it translates into the fact that we're the startup nation and that a, a lot of countries that are bigger than, our, than, our, than us and that are more, that are richer than our than us don't manage to do what we do. So how do you do it? How does the startup nation, as you put it, the nation that has actually the most startups, per, per, I think, per, per, per capita <laughs> in the world, how do they bring in, how do they make it more inclusive, both for 
uh, Israelis and for Palestinians. How do you bring Palestinians into all of this? I think that there is a lot of initiative from Israeli entrepreneurs, um, from sometimes also uh, institutions that can be governmental or not go governmental to try to make it more inclusive. But I think that um, a lot of Israeli entrepreneurs and, and the high tech, uh, um, the high tech in general, is very aware of the fact that we need to distribute this wealth and we need to distribute this uh, this chance that we have to have developed um, the high tech here. So, you know, there is a lot of things that are being done. I hope that more and more will be done and that we'll be able to get closer the one from each other through working together. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much, Jeremy thank Brabe. Uh, Adonai. Sorry. Adonai. 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 Thank you for thank you for being with us. Thank and, you for inviting me. And uh, that we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. I want to thank uh, all of uh, our panelists uh, for joining us uh, for this uh, special edition. Our correspondents: Iris Mockler, uh, Chris Moore, in uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, where again it's uh, been not a celebration, but a. Uh, uh, a, a tragic day with dozens uh, killed. Uh, as for what happens next, well, the future uh, is unwritten. It's something we'll, of course, continue to talk about in the coming days, the fallouts uh, for the entire region of the events that have transpired. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of the France 24 debate from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. <laughs>